Well, good morning. If you'd open your Bibles with me to the book of Philippians as we're in that incredible fourth chapter. I remember I first encountered this chapter of the Bible back when I was 24 years of age and I moved from Arkansas to come to seminary here in Fort Worth. And I would admit to you, my early days of seminary did not go well. You got to realize who I was at that point. I'd only been a Christ follower, a believer for four years. And uh, I had very little biblical or church background. And suddenly I was going to the largest seminary in the world, some of the greatest theologians in the world. And sitting next to me in class were folks who had degree from Dallas Baptist and Oklahoma Baptist and Baylor and Washita. And they'd been through all these classes before. And here I was starting brand new. And I would admit to you, I was incredibly intimidated. And one of my very first classes, 8 o'clock in the morning, was with Dr. Bill Toller, one of the most brilliant men that I'd ever known in my life. And he taught biblical backgrounds. And one day he started class. He said, men and women, I want to just start with something with you today. He held up his Bible and he said, I know as you are now trying to study this book and interpret it to others, it can be a very daunting task. And he said, you're going to encounter people whose names you cannot pronounce, the Hezekiahs and Jeremiahs and Nebuchadnezzars. He said, you're going to hear about peoples, the Jebusites and the Hittites, groups of people that no longer exist anymore. He said, you're going to hear about cities that if you look at a map, they're not on the map any longer. They no longer exist. And yet you're going to have the responsibility of taking this Bible and presenting it week by week to people. He said, let me give you a suggestion. He says, as you look at the Bible, if the Bible has a lot to say about something, you should say a lot about it. If it doesn't have much to say, you don't have to say much. And that's one of the reasons why I love that at Fielder we go through books, because that keeps us tied to the Word of God. And what the Bible speaks a lot about, we get to speak a lot about. If it doesn't say much about what's happening, we're not responsible to say much about that. Well, today we're going to deal with an issue that may be one of the major themes of the Bible. It's almost on every single page. Every character in the Bible except Jesus uh, dealt with this issue in his life or her life. And we see myriad of examples of, of how God's people were confronted with issues like this and how God led them to deal with it, as we're going to look at in chapter 4 of the book of Philippians. But you say, Gary, what would that issue be? And it's the issue, listen to this word, the issue of worry and anxiety and fear about the future. And as you look through the Bible, you'll discover that every character in the Bible dealt with this. Abraham, uh, when he he didn't see a child coming, what did he do? Out of worry and anxiety, he took things into his own hands and made such a great mistake. We have Jacob, as we looked at him and, and the book of Genesis. This was a guy that was so fearful about the future and was an incredible manipulator. That's what we can find ourselves doing is we try and manipulate and control everything that happens when we begin to worry. But then we have just simply the apostle Peter, this fisherman from Galilee. When he sees Jesus getting ready to go to the cross and he wonders about his future, what do you find him doing? You find him denying Jesus. And so what you discover is this trait, this attitude, this direction of life can be something that can be very, very harmful to us. It's described in the psalm in chapter 37, verse number 8. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself because it tends only towards evil. For the evildoer shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land." What this is saying to you and me is when we begin to move towards worry and worry and anxiety is a part of our life, that's not a good pathway. It's going to take us some places we don't want to go. We're going to see one of those in the very beginning of this text as as we watch some people uh, deal with this issue. And and, and at the center point of chapter 4 is is one of the most famous statements in all of the Bible when it says to us, listen, you need to pray, be anxious about, uh, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, take it to God in prayer. So let's begin, though, in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. It says, therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, 
stand firm thus in the Lord. Now, by the way, many of your uh, uh, versions of the Bible connect this to the third chapter because they've just been told that they are citizens of another place, citizens of heaven, and they're going to have to learn how to stand firm in the things of the Lord as they live here upon this earth. And he says, stand firm, uh, my brothers, uh, in the Lord. Verse number two, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syndectiche to agree in the Lord. Now, by the way, that agree in the Lord is also found in the second chapter of this, but that they would agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, as you look at this, I would admit to you when I was very first assigned this text, I felt like this was an aside. How in the world did this relate to worry? But then I began to think in terms of the context of the fourth chapter of the book of Philippians, a group of people whose, first of all, their leader was in prison and was facing uh, uh, execution. (laughs) They themselves in uh, Philippi were being persecuted. Uh, They had special places in the prison just for them. And many of them were being put into prison. And not only were they being persecuted, they were being told in the middle of this persecution to stand firm in the Lord and, and, and not to let worry dominate them. But apparently, worry and fretting about the future was leading to disunity in the church. Now, as you look at these two ladies, there apparently was some problem between them. Now, you, you will notice in this text is Paul didn't identify what the problem was. And second of all, he did not tell them exactly how to handle that. I think he did that on purpose. What he was saying is throughout the life of the church, you're going to have broken relationships. And certainly you should never just sweep those uh, broken relationships under the rug, that you're not going to be able to be the church God wants you to be if you just smooth over those things and go on. But listen to what he does. And you'll find that he does this throughout the fourth chapter. Instead of solving the problem, He changed the focus because here's what was happening to these two people is they were focused upon their battle, their issue, their problem. And their issue and their problem was getting them to miss the fact that they were a part of a church and a group of people that were partnering for the kingdom of God. It reminds me of uh, of how it was addressed in the book of James because in the book of James, this apparently was being addressed when it says, what causes quarrels? And what causes fights among you? Fourth chapter, verse 1. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder one another. Uh, You covet, cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And when you do ask and do not receive, it's because you ask wrongly. You want to spend it on your passions. What he's saying right here is when your focus is yourself and your passions and your feelings and how you feel you have been wronged and you've been hurt, what it does is cause you to bring yourself to a a very inwardly focused uh, 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 lifestyle. And he said that kind of focus is always going to lead you down the wrong path. And you say, well, what do I deal with that? Well, I think what he's saying right here is why don't you deal with this and, and get it settled as best you can and move on to something bigger. Move on to the gospel. He said, listen, you realize we're sh- putting shoulder to shoulder, arm to arm for the gospel, and we're moving towards the gospel being fulfilled. And do you realize that whatever is going on with any of you, whatever is causing worry and division and fretting, he said, you're going to have to learn to just get that dealt with and get on to living for the gospel. Because what he said in this text is that that these encounters amongst people can cause division and bitterness and broken relationships, and those things can begin to dominate us. And the way that we deal with them is to change our focus and be reminded that we are focused upon the kingdom of God, not ourselves, that we are citizens of another kingdom. And we need to recognize that pushing that kingdom forward is always more important than what's happening in our lives. Now, I know as I say this, there could be some of you watching like me. You've got some places in your life where your relationships are broken. And and certainly there's some 
issues maybe between you and someone else, and you have several ways you can go about it. You can get together and argue it out and debate it out, see who wins, see who is right, see who is going to get what they want, and, and, and who ought to ask forgiveness, and who is to blame, and, or manipulate the situation. But he said, you know something? Do you realize those kind of things are small issues when it is compared to the fact we're living in a lost world? We're living in a world that needs the gospel desperately. And what we need to be pursuing is the bigger picture is the gospel, the kingdom of God. And if you'll do that, you'll find unity happening in the church in a new direction to your life. As I looked at this, I was reminded of an experience I had in high school. I was a guy who worked in a restaurant, and one of the things you oftentimes did at breakfast time is you'd take people a cup of coffee. And I found by the time I got the coffee from the coffee urn to the person, I'd spilt about half of it. One day I was watching one of the guys who had been there a long time, and he never seemed to do that. And I said, tell me what you're doing. He said, well, he said, here's the deal. When you walk with a cup of coffee, if you focus on the coffee, every time it sloshes, you will move to try and correct it. And you'll find yourself, you'll get there with about half of the coffee. But what you need to do is focus on where you're going and just start that direction. And you'll be surprised how steady you stay as you move in that direction. Now, that doesn't mean I never spilt any coffee, but it was amazing how it changed that. And it could be that's what could change in your life today. Right now, you could be living in situations where relationships are broken and it's created a negative atmosphere in your life. And, and all you think about is that broken relationship, and that broken relationship dominates you. I want you to know as long as you're focused on being right on your passions, what's inside of you, those relationships like that are going to dominate you. And worry and fretting about it's going to dominate you. What he says in this situation is you need to focus on the big picture, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then he moves into one of the most famous parts of the fourth chapter. And he says to us, yes, that's the negative way to deal with problems in your life. But let's move to the positive. That if you want to know how to deal with worry, you're going to have to learn some things about prayer. That if you cannot learn how to get before God and draw God into your life and your circumstance, you're going to keep worrying and fretting and anxiety and fear will always grip you. It'll take you down some paths you have never been to. But you know something? If you can learn how to bring these things to the Lord, you'll find God doing something that's incredible in your life. It begins in verse number 4, verse 4 through 7. Many of you have memorized these verses. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. By the way, in the Scripture, when it repeats something, that's God making an emphasis. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness, underline the word reasonableness, be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. Wow, that's a big statement. Never be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And what will happen? The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He says right here, is the great antidote to worry and anxiety is prayer. I'm afraid what I oftentimes do is I take so little to the Lord in prayer. That's why my life oftentimes is filled with worry and anxiety. And he says to us right here, take every single thing to the Lord in prayer. And you will discover God doing something in your soul where you used to be driven by passions and what you wanted for yourself. You will find replacing all of that a peace that surpasses all understanding. Now, he begins with this double uh, uh, positive rejoice. By the way, that's a command. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. What he's saying is God's not saying to us that everything happening to us we have to like. He's not saying to us that everything about us that's going in the wrong direction, uh, that, that we, we ought to be happy about it. But what he's saying, again, is we have to learn to change our focus. If our focus is upon our problem and the world around us and its passions that are driving us, we're going to be tossed to and fro, and we're never going to get anywhere in our relationship with God and the world we live in. But what we have to do is think about what never changes, what will never move, 
And I'd ask you this morning, is what do you see in your world that never changes, never moves? There's only one thing. It's the Lord. Everything else about our life is changing constantly. And the one thing that absolutely never changes is the Lord. And you say, well, Gary, how do I find joy just in the Lord? How can I draw my life and bring him into that circle and, and, and out of it come joy? Because look at these things happening to my life. Well, let's just stop for a minute and think about all the things that we have in the Lord and see if we can find some place to rejoice. First of all, in the Lord, my relationship with God's not based upon my performance or my ability to, to measure up. I don't have to be a perfect person because I know Christ. I can experience the grace of God. And it says in the book of Hebrews that I can come boldly under the throne room of God, not because of how good I am, but because of the grace and the mercy of God. I have a high priest and his name is Jesus, and I can always get to the Heavenly Father through him. Another thing it says is when my life goes awry, I don't have to manipulate and solve things. I don't have to do like Abraham, figure out a solution and go get the solution that I can literally bring my situations to the Lord and give them to the Lord because it says in this text, the Lord's right here with you. I know in my life that the one person who knows what is happening in my life much more than anybody else is Jesus. And so when I bring my issues to Jesus, I, I, I'm a person that can find someone very well acquainted with what's happening in my life, who has brought forgiveness to my life, who has brought a new life to me, and who has says to me, listen, I want you to know if you will get with me and see what you have in me, you'll find something bubbling up out of your life called joy. Joy in the midst of even difficult circumstances. Could you take a moment and think about what God's done in your life? Last week, Jason shared his story of how God changed his life in college. Same thing happened to me in college between my sophomore and junior year. I found Jesus Christ. Did you take a moment and think about that incredible miracle, that story that you had? that brought to you a relationship with God that was supernatural and gave to you eternity. My goodness, as you do that, it's very easy to rejoice in the Lord. Yes, again, Lord, I will keep rejoicing in you. But then also, as you look at this, you realize he starts with that. So we would take our little problem to a big God. We're not rejoicing in the church. We're not rejoicing in our pastor. We're not rejoicing in our ability. We're rejoicing in the Lord. And there's no problem that's too big for our Lord. And that's why he begins with this idea of rejoicing. But then the next thing he does with this, he says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. He says in this text is you are being asked by God to live your life in front of people at work, in your family, in your church, in your small group. And he said, you need to recognize that how you handle this isn't just about you, that the world is watching what you do, and, and, and the world's wanting to see if God's at work and if you really believe all the things that you say. And, and he uses this word reasonableness. Now, it, it is a word, if you have a, other versions of the New Testament, you'll find it's translated a variety of ways. One of the commentators said it's because this word is so full of meaning that one word cannot really fulfill what it means and, and, and really speak to what's going on right here. The word I like that's found in, in one of the versions is let your gentleness be known to all men. Now, where do you get gentleness for? What, what it's talking about is a person that is at peace. They, they, they find a gentleness in their soul. Last week, Jason talked to us about Paul on the road to Damascus. And what was Paul doing? Paul, Jesus came to Paul and said, Paul, why are you fighting me? Why are you fighting me? Why are you fighting me? That's not gentleness. That's somebody who's fighting with God. And he said, you're kicking against the goads. And a goad was how they kept an animal in the center of the road. And what it's saying right here is you're going to be walking this pathway of faith and God's trying to keep you in the right pathway. And the way you find gentleness and faith in front of everyone else is to learn how to trust in God. Even when you do not see God at work, John MacArthur says we endure injustice, mistreatment, and humiliation 
without retaliation, bitterness, or vengeance. It is someone in the midst of a great battle who has learned to trust in God. And what happens is, is the world watches us living in a world like the rest of the world is living in, and the rest of the world is fighting to get things done. And yet for the believer, because they've learned how to pray, there is a gentleness in their spirit. It's not about being right. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about learning to live in the middle of the kingdom of God. And the world begins to see that there's something controlling us that is bigger than circumstances. What's controlling us is God. In, in the Sermon on the Mount, this word is used to describe meekness. And I remember the first time I went through the Sermon on the Mount, the word meekness, and that's the same idea right here, is speaking about a large, several hundred pound horse that's allowed a bit to be put in their mouth. And here this animal that's five times as big as the person that's on top in the saddle has allowed a bit to be put in their mouth, and that bit directs them whichever way they are going. That's what this is saying to us. It's saying to us we may not understand where God's taking us. We may not like what's happening in our lives. And if we fight it and fight it and argue with God and try and get our way and manipulate it and even use prayer to get what we want, we're going to find ourselves going in some wrong directions. But when we allow God to put the bit in our mouths. What we do is change our focus off our problems to where God's leading us, and we begin to allow God to lead us. And when we begin to allow God to lead us, then we find God doing supernatural things. So it starts with joy. Then it goes to lordship, but then it goes to the next step. It says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. He's saying to you and me right now, there's not an issue too small or an issue too big that we cannot take to our God that God does not care about. And you say, well, wait a minute, Gary. What about this issue and what about this issue? Is that too little for a great almighty God or what about this? Well, let me just say, when it says everything, what I think he's saying right here is that there's a place that's causing worry and anxiety. God wants you to bring that to him. It's not too small. Not too small. You can't say, hey, God, I know this is a little thing, but would you help me find my car keys? I want you to know if it's causing that in your life, God says to us, everything in your life, everything that's happening, realize that your belief in God is that God can deal with it. And what faith is, faith is, is through prayer to trust those things in the hand of God. That's what prayer and supplication is. I, I like what Francis Chan said about this in his book, Crazy Love. Worry implies we don't quite trust God is big enough, powerful enough, or loving enough to take care of what's happening in our lives. This behavior communicates that it's okay to sin and not trust God because the stuff in my life is somehow exceptional. God says to us, whatever's happening in your life, wherever you're going, whatever you're facing, learn to bring that issue before a mighty God and learn to see what God's going to do with it, but also means learn to trust him with that and give that with that and learn that he's going to help you through that situation. You know, there's no one who dealt with this issue better than Jesus. And I, I know this is a lengthy text, but I, I really believe the words of Jesus speak to this better than anyone out of Matthew chapter 6. Therefore, I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you eat, what you'll drink, nor your body, nor what you put on. It's not life more than food, the body more than clothing. That's the little stuff. Look at the birds of the air. They sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they not, you not more valuable than they? And which of you being anxious can add one hour to the span of your life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they neither toil or spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, Gary, you of little faith, therefore don't be anxious, saying, what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What am I going to wear? For the Gentiles seek, that word seek means it pursues with vigor after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom. Change your focus. 
His righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. They're not to, therefore be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself, sufficient if for that day is its own trouble. Do you know what happens when we begin to present these things to the Lord? It describes it in this verse. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. We have a heavenly Father a creator of the entire universe that beckons you and me, that begs you and me, that stands all day long, it says, with arms outstretched, saying, come to me. I know where you are. I know what you're facing. And bring this to me by prayer and supplication and learn to see what I'm going to do this situation in your life. He said, well, Gary, you know something? I get that. I, I, and I, I've had so many times in my life where God's done that, and, and, and there in my prayer closet, or as I'm praying, there's a peace that comes on my soul, and it's wonderful. But here's the problem. I get up from the prayer closet, and I'm still confronting the same issues, the same people, the same problems. In fact, those problems and those issues from the past and the present still come back to haunt me, still come back to attack me. What, what in the world do I do? Well, first of all, the Bible says pray without ceasing. So if you're going to be a person of prayer, you, you can't just designate a time you're going to pray. You, you need to know that it, it, it's a constant battle within your life. But he moves in the last part of this. With this incredible way to live our life every day. Finally, brothers, verse 8. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is commendable, if there is any excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, listen to this, think about these things. What you've learned, received, and heard in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. What it's talking about is the battle, as we get up from the prayer clause, it's going to be in our mind. Because when we get up from the prayer time, and as we're praying along the way, those issues are going to come after us. I promise you, the evil one, does not like the peace of God operating in their life. So he's going to orchestrate ways in which it comes up again and again and again. It says, think on these things. And we say, wow, whatever is true and honorable and just and pure and lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise, where do you find that? Well, as I looked at this, I've never found an individual in my life that perfectly exemplifies these things. But I know one who does, and his name is Jesus. And what he wants us to do is to recognize on a day-by-day -day basis is if our focus is on the things of this world, we're going to worry and fret and be anxious. But if on a day-by-day -day basis, a moment-by-moment -moment basis, we focus upon Jesus, the one who's saved us and brought the gospel to us, the one who's transformed our lives and given us the gift of eternity, if we will think about him and let him be the focus of our lives, we will find some peace in our soul even as we get up from the prayer closet. But then I, I want to take this a step further because certainly Jesus is someone who lived 2,000 years ago and we have this incredible Bible that talks about him. I want you to know in my life, it is great to see who he was and what he's done. It helps my life to have what I would call object lessons. People who are living out this faith and doing what God has called them to do. He says in this text, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Now, I remember the first time I read this, I thought, that's kind of arrogant. No, what Paul was simply saying is you're watching me live in a prison. You're watching me being persecuted. You knew that I was thrown into jail there in Philippi, your town. You guys have heard how I've been opposed and what's going on. And you need to know, I didn't live a perfect life. I, I'm not a perfect person. But you have observed that I went after these issues by faith and by trust in God. And you've watched me wrestle with it. And if you could learn from others to see what they're doing and to hear from them, you might find something God would do in your life that's incredible because they become an object for you. Now, let me just back up and say that's why our church is organized around two basic groups to help that. One is D groups, where you're on a one to three, one to five group, and you can have three people of the same gender. And what you're going to discover is God's going to put you with people that have been where you are, going with you are. What does God want you to do? He wants you to learn from them. 
You and I are not self-sufficient. There's none of us who get seminary degrees that's going to get us through everything. We need other people. That's why we need small groups. My wife and I are part of a small group, and I want you to know those are the 21 people we depend upon in times of trouble. They're the very first line of attack that we go to when there's a problem. And what's so wonderful is I have within that group lots of people who have gone through stuff that I can watch how they live what they do. It becomes such an object. Listen to me. Listen, and I can call them and say, what did you do here? What is that simply saying? It's saying not only do we need a relationship with Christ, we need each other. And the reason why we have a church, I can't wait for us to start coming back together because we need to gather together with one another. Why? Because we need those relationships in life that help us. And today, if you found yourself standing on the periphery, don't do that any longer. Because you're going to find yourself as a lone wolf. What God wants to do is put you with a group of people that you can help, that can also help you. So as you face worrisome, anxiety, difficult situations in life, and you look at the future with fear, you can have some people that will help buoy you in that arena. Let me maybe close with this story. Uh, about three weeks ago, as you know, when we had the Snowmageddon, and Everybody lost electricity. My son, Matt, and his wife, Mel, and my grandson, uh, Drew, they lost electricity. So they came to stay with us on Monday and uh, waiting on their electricity. We were checking it every single day. And, and so we had the five of us living together. And I noticed a couple of days into this experience that I was tired. I just thought maybe it's chasing a three-year-old around the house a lot and, and all that was going on with that. And then the next day, I was even a little more tired. And then it got to Thursday, and they went home. And I found on Friday, I was just exhausted. And so I, I said to Sandy on Saturday morning after that, uh, I said, I, I'm going to go take a COVID test because I want to find out if I do have this, what I need to do. So we went just next door, close to our house. And I tell you, it, it was a sobering moment when that nurse came back in the room and said, you have tested positive for COVID. And I go, oh, and here's your sheet that shows you have tested positive, and you ought to do these things. And I walked out. It cost me 40 bucks I paid, and the lady looked at me at the desk and said, by the way, would you go outside and get away from the other people because you have COVID in about five minutes? My wife walked out the door and discovered that Saturday that both of us had the pandemic disease. And so we went back home, and I want you to know, it, it, was, a, it was an incredible experience and journey. And uh, the fatigue and the coughing, and, and my wife has one of those uh, uh, Apple watches that gives you the blood oxygen. And she was putting it on me, and I was checking with her about every hour. And, and I would admit, at my age, it was very sobering because that week, one of my best friends in Forney, Jimmy Pritchard, went in the hospital and was gone in three days. Another good friend of mine, Rod Masteller, longtime friend of mine, my age, boom, died of COVID, was in the hospital. Another friend of mine, Hayes Wicker, was 28 days in the hospital on ventilators and stuff. And I want you to know, during those days, it was some sobering time to, to begin to go, you know, Lord, will I get to see my grandkids again? Will I get to see my church family again? Will one of us take a downward path right here and, and what I've been about is all over. And I would admit to you that, that, that the worry and the anxiety and the fear gripped me like crazy. And so I, I was reading through a devotion process I'm doing, and that process happened to take me to the book of Genesis. And I was studying about Joseph. And you know Joseph's story. He was sold into slavery, was thrown into prison. No one believed him. No one helped him. But God was always at work, and then he got reconciled back to his brothers, and his brothers were fearful of what he was going to do. And in that last chapter, chapter 50, Joseph said to his brothers who were scared that he was going to do, he said, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but, against me, but God meant it for good, to bring about many people that should be kept alive today so do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus be comforted them and spoke kindly to them. It was amazing. The peace that came over my soul as I said, wait a minute, I'm not God. I, I can't deal with this. I, I don't have any medicine that will solve this. Yes, in the next hours, I could head downhill and this would be it. 
And you know, Lord, I want you to know I've had a great life. You've blessed me so much. But today, Lord, I'm going to put the bit in my mouth. And I'm going to say, I belong to you. And I'm bringing this before you today that say, if you give me hours, days, weeks, months, years to live, I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and how you want to use my life by life or by death, I put into your hands. Wow. The peace of God surpasses our understanding. Grabbed a hold of my life. Now, some of you right now, worry dominates you. These last 12, 14 months, you've lived in fear. You've, you've lived in a worrisome life. You've seen your economics turned down. You've had some issues in your family. Maybe this tension has brought issues to bear around those that you love and those that you appreciate. I want you to know God understands that. And what he's calling you and me to do is to learn how to live by faith. Learn how to trust in him. Learn how to rejoice in him. Learn how to be gentle. Give this thing to the Lord. Then move from that place to focus on the Lord and be a part of an encouragement community. And I'd pray today that if there are some places of worry and fretting in your life, that you'll be able to step out in faith. Specifically, if you don't have the promise of eternity, I want you to know if you don't have the promise of eternity, there should be some fear in your life and worry. Because God wants to save you through the gospel. And later on, we're going to show you how you can connect with someone who will tell you about the Jesus that can change your life. And what we're going to do right now is I'm going to pray. And after we pray, we're going to share the Lord's table that is a reminder to us of this great gospel that we enjoy. Lord, thank you today for Philippians 4 from a group of people who are struggling with the same stuff we struggle with. I pray, oh God, you'll teach us how to pray. And as you teach us how to pray, then how to live by faith and keep our focus on the big issue of the gospel and the kingdom of God for your glory. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.